Now, for some strange particular reason, I decided I was going to watch Raw last night. And not just watch a little bit of it, some of it, or most of it. I made the conscientious, sober decision to watch the entire show from beginning to end. Why? Why would I do that to myself? Even the old motto of, I watch so you don't have to. No. There's just no real good justifiable reason for me to make that choice last night. To actually sit down for over three hours and watch Monday Night Raw. Why would I do that? Why? Why? What, because football season's over? There are plenty of other things I could have found to watch on TV last night or on the interwebs or whatever the case might be. I could have hit the spank bag. I could have done any number of other numerous things. But instead, I decided that I was going to watch Raw. And since I actually watched the entire show from beginning to end, that leaves me with no choice, no choice, but to review the show. Which, let's be realistic here. There are probably only two things that really matter, and the rest of it is just forgettable, typical drivel. And mind you, it's been a few months, I think, since I've watched a full episode of Raw from beginning to end. So kind of coming at this a little bit from a fresher perspective. Because I'm not that ingrained in what's going on. I'm not that committed or invested into anything that is going on. I don't already have biases or notions about certain things because a lot of the stuff literally that's happening on Raw right now is brand spanking new to me. Like, I hardly even knew that Samoa Joe was on commentary, but apparently he's not on commentary anymore. And he's out there to help save Kevin Owens from AOP and Seth Rollins, who apparently now is a heel... And yet, it still reminds me, it doesn't matter whether he's a face, it doesn't matter whether he's a heel, Seth Rollins is boring and just sucks! So, what is all of this building up to? I don't know, and I don't particularly care. Oh, but I'm sure for a lot of you, Aleister Black versus Buddy Murphy ranks very high on your list of, at least here's what professional wrestling should be all about, I'm going to tweet about it, and I'm going to talk about how awesome it is. So typical. They had a match at a pay-per-view, so now here comes the rematch. And if I'm not mistaken, according to what people told me last night, because again, I didn't watch TLC, and I haven't been watching Raw, Aleister Black won both of the matches, so what the hell was the point? It's just like so much other crap they have. They take two guys that they don't have anything for, they throw them together, they do nothing with them, and then they have nothing for them afterwards. The hell makes you think this is good? What the hell lets you sit there and be satisfied by that? Our standards have dropped that low? Oh, Aleister Black. Aleister Black's nothing. Because they've made it that way. Buddy Murphy is nothing. Because they've made it that way. And this whole stupid concept of, well, you're going to make people care with their matches, when all you have on your show largely are pointless filler matches. It's not helping anybody. Get it for your back stalls! I'm still trying to figure out what the hell's in Eric Rowan's cage. I'm assuming based off of the reactions of... Uh, who, who was it that was freaking out? Ah! Must have been some <laughs> library of Lars Sullivan's porn. Um, but yeah, Eric Rowan apparently is getting a big push now. Okay. You know... Keep this in mind. Just because a guy is bigger doesn't mean that I'm automatically down with what they're doing with him. I don't really know. And again, because I haven't been watching in a while, it's my first time seeing it, I'm not really sure about what the hell they're doing, which I think is kind of the larger point. Is sometimes it's nice to take a little bit of time away to come back and kind of refresh the perspective about it and think about it from a different way and view things in a different lens. And in particular, in this case, trying to sit there and determine Hey, I haven't watched in a while. What are you doing with this guy? Why is it interesting? Why should I care? And I got none of that answered last night with Eric Rowan. What was fascinating to me was Charlotte Flair calling out somebody 
And it's Natalia answering the bell. Like this is supposed to be a big freaking deal. But what really was the big deal to me was looking at Charlotte. You talk about plastic surgery botches. When is enough way too damn much? Now you look at pictures of her from a few years ago. Yeah, granted, not my cup of tea. But she looked infinitely more feminine, infinitely more real, infinitely less plasticky than she looks now. Like, she looks gross. And I don't know if that's on her for being insecure about who she is, or if that is on society for making her feel like she needs to get all that surgery. It's a combination of both whatever the hell it is. I've never understood for the life of me why people want to get a bunch of plastic surgery like that, especially when it looks this bad. What was even worse was the fact that this match went on for like 20 damn minutes, it felt like. Like, you know it's bad, where as soon as Natalia's music hits, the dogs come running up to me because they want to go take a piss. Charlotte and Natalia was my dog's designated piss break of the night, and I can't blame them. Like, you're talking about Charlotte's supposed to be the queen, but you have this way too damn long match against a performer in Natalia who hasn't really, really, truly mattered in a long damn time. And why the hell is Natalia taking so long to tap out of the figure eight? Stupid. It was just a waste of time. The Street Profits and the OC. Now help me understand. The OC won a tag tournament at Crown Jewel or whatever. Uh, I guess they beat the Raw Tag Champions. And again, I'm trying to catch up here. So if I screw up a detail, please forgive me. And here are the Street Profits talking about in their debut, how they beat the OC. So... We're going to have a match to see who's better and who should end up getting a shot at the Viking Raiders, the tag champions. And then even though the Street Profits win, we're still just going to announce a triple threat any damn way. See, and this is exactly why fans stop taking the product seriously. They stop getting invested in people and anything that happens. Because you're throwing up this match for a pointless reason. Because you're ultimately going to end up doing the crap anyways. If there was no consequence for the OC losing the match, then why the hell have the match? And even for me looking at this, you've got one group in the OC who I've always thought has been overrated as bricks. Oh, you the Boring as hell. And you look at the Street Profits. I'm sorry, I'm just not going to get down with yet another Finn stereotype type of gimmick. I think Montez Ford is a real talent. You could look at him, and even if you excuse the size, you could see a guy with personality, charisma. He has a bit of that it factor. He could be somebody. Angelo Dawkins looks like a lazier version of D'Lo Brown, kind of along for the ride, but you could maybe do a little less something with him. But we're talking about Red Sippy. We're talking about Red Solo Cups, and we're talking about catching the smoke. And we're just doing the same type of stereotypical BS that we see this company do so often with their black performers, their black acts. And not everybody has to be like this, Vince! Come on! I don't know what they were going for with Drew McIntyre talking to the crowd and then destroying the merch marks. I don't... The merch marks being Hawkins a writer, of course. I don't know what they were going for there. Uh, Andrade is the new U.S. champion, so... They've got him beating a jobber, and then Ricochet comes out to challenge him, which of course means somebody thought it was a good idea to give him a microphone, and even if it's short and sweet and to the point, it still sucks because Ricochet can't talk! And then Andrade beats Ricochet anyways, which to me, I can say, hey, they had him beat Ray at MSG, wasn't it? So it gives you a little bit of an element of, you never know what could happen at the house show, you need to go every once in a while, makes sense. And he comes back, beats a job, or then he beats Ricochet, like I'm trying to establish a champ, you know, relatively well, except the whole time I'm just looking at it and I'm just saying how much I feel like Selena Vega overshadows and overpowers him. But nonetheless, it is what it is. But there are only two things that mattered on this night. Like, I had written down notes to remind myself of the other crap that I largely didn't pay attention to that I've already talked about. We don't need it anymore. Number one, Randall Keith Orton. This was going to be a work the whole time. And as soon as they set it up and started it out, you could tell it smelled. It smelled of a fake out. It smelled of a work. Which in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean that's a bad thing. 
What's just astounding to me, though, is they carried over something from house show, working up an injury angle, just for Randy Orton to freaking <laughs> RKO AJ Styles anyways. Like, this company has no patience to let anything play out. Now, granted, the whole time this is going on, I'm sitting there saying to myself, don't sit there and be pumping up AJ versus Orton at WrestleMania. Nobody needs to see that. And more importantly, nobody wants to see that. Most especially of all, I do not want to see that. Because the only thing that matters, the only thing that matters is one match for one Randall Keith Orton at WrestleMania. And you why, guys, all know what I'm alluding to. You, you, you! All of you! You know what I'm talking about. And more importantly, you know you want it. You know you want it. You know you need it. And you know deep, deep down in the cockles of your heart and soul that you've got to have it. And no, it's not Randy Orton versus Ed. You know exactly what the hell I'm talking about. It's breakfast club business. As long as that hope that dream, that vision, that reality is still even a remote possibility, then I do have something to look forward to in 2020. This whole segment, it was all child's play. Who cares? It's all about the bigger and better long-term goal of the real main event of WrestleMania. Which brings us to... I think morbidly, deep down inside, the reason I decided to watch all three plus hours of Raw this week, the Lana Lashley wedding. Oh my god. As soon as I saw the minister. And he looked like Mr. Belding and Mr. Belding had lost 100 pounds. I said, oh God, this is going to be a train wreck. Even beyond the typical train wrecks you get with a wrestling one. At one point, I'm trying to determine if Lana and Lashley get their eyebrows done by the same person. Lana goes in at one point to kiss Lashley. And she comes back. And she looks like she ate Bobby Lashley's ass on the wrong day. She, like she was Gabrielle Union trying to pull a Dwayne Wade out of it. She got him on the wrong time. <laughs> the salad blasted back. So you're watching Lana for a good portion of the entire segment. And the bitch looks like she got shit on her. Oh, God. Oh, my God. <laughs> from, from, from Lana's first husband <laughs> to Lashley's first husband. <laughs> You're thinking to yourself, you know the whole time in the wedding cake where it should be somebody like Big Dick Johnson or Lars Sullivan or Paul Heyman dressed as the New Year's baby. You know it's going to be freaking Rusev. You're wondering what in the hell else can take this and run this straight down the crapper. Well, not only, not only, not only does Lana look like she ate Lashley's ass on the wrong day, out comes Liv Morgan. To talk about her love. <laughs> and not the love with Bobby Lashley. They were lesbian <laughs> And not even the type of lesbian where you're going to get some of that good old Eric Bischoff HRA hot lesbian action. They couldn't even do that right. <laughs> <laughs> I know Vince had to be cuffing and cuckling, luckling the whole goddamn time backstage. 
He's probably telling Paul Heyman he wants to give him a raise because, my God, this segment's going to get a ton of views on YouTube. And that's apparently what matters. <laughs> <laughs> they were idiots that thought Paul Heyman being in charge of Raw's creative was going to be a good thing. Ha! Ah, ah, ah. You stupid idiots! You stupid idiots! Or are you just going to blame Vince for this? Because you got to excuse the golden boy, Paul Heyman. <laughs> so let me get this straight. You've made... He managed to make this year. Lana looked like the whore of a lifetime because she was married to one guy, left him for Rusev, now leaving Rusev for Bobby Lashley all the while. She apparently has a lesbian love affair with freaking Liv Morgan, who they spent weeks and weeks building up to her return, apparently. And this is what the hell they did. I guess the bitch was ready to strike up on the night, huh? Ha! <laughs> ha! And then, and then, here come the reactions of Sonny DeVille, an actual certified lesbo, <laughs> mad at the fact that she's been wanting to do a lesbian-themed storyline for a long time, and Vince took one look at it and said, nah, bitch, <laughs> only blondes get to be lesbian now. <laughs> you can't make this shit up. <laughs> You can't make this shit up! <laughs> Certified lesbian wants to do a lesbian angle, so they take her idea and they say, nah, we're gonna put it on the working. <laughs> For those of you that wanted this storyline to end, congratulations! It's probably building up towards a big time match with the Royal Rumble! Have at it! For those of you that wanted to see Liv Moore get back, or oh, maybe she'll be associated with the Fiend. <laughs> be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. For those of you that are pissed off that Sonya Deville, an actual real-life lesbian, wasn't utilized in this angle, how about a couple of things? Number one, just because she's lesbian doesn't mean she has to portray a lesbian or a lesbian angle on television. Number two, why in the hell would you want her to be a part of this joke farce crap hole of a storyline any damn ways. Why would you want her to be a part of this? And number three. And number three. The hell cares about Sonny DeVille any damn ways one way or another? <laughs> I know what some of you are going to say. Hashtag brunettes are lesbians too. <laughs> this vacillated so much between one of the worst things I've seen in a long, long time to one of the most entertaining trademarks I've seen in a long, long time to one of these things that I sit back and think to myself, this is how sad and pathetic professional wrestling has become in this decade that at the end of 2019, this storyline that is trash, that has no real payoff, it just manages to make Lana look like the slut of the decade, is by far the most captivating and exciting thing that I saw on Monday night. Now, everybody enjoys different things, and that's the way it should be. I can enjoy good, and I can enjoy bad every bit as much, if not more. And this was bad. Make no mistake about it. This was horrible. This was the drizzling SHI, you know what. But it crossed over to being so bad, and so train wrecky, and so spectacular. It's like the Attitude Era. It. <laughs> it's like the remedial version of the Attitude Era. <laughs> and then worst of all, the cake was actually made out of real cake. <laughs> and Rusev couldn't even hit the damn spot right to reveal himself. So you got no consummation of the marriage in terms of vows, and vows alone, we're not going there. We found out 
<laughs> that Lana is through two husbands working on number three. All the while, she's some polyamorous bitch in love with another blonde like Liv Morgan who they spent weeks building up the returning just to throw her into this lesbian cesspool storyline. <laughs> The YouTube views are going to explode for the segments related to this. You know The television ratings probably be absolute crap. <laughs> It'd be crazy if the ratings were, or the viewership numbers were the exact same as they were last week, but there was still money in football. But nonetheless, it is <laughs> They spent the whole night building up to this. Didn't even do a good job of really building up to it. There were no bridesmaids. There were, no, there were no best band. <laughs> Dude looked like Mr. Belding money is a hundred pounds. I'm sorry. But professional wrestling has been a cesspool of suck for a few years now. <laughs> and if I can find just a little bit of morbid entertainment out of something so bad, let me have it! Let me have it! It's mine! 